would I out myself as a person with a drinking problem in Canada's biggest newspaper? And my editor said, are you independently wealthy? And I said, no. And she said, then you can't because you will never get a job again. The irony is, it's like, oh my God, the shock horror. You were in charge of a big university and you were drinking too much. Well, I hate to break it to you, but <laughs> there is a lot of people in charge of a lot of things that is drinking too much. And rare is the family that's untouched. That's it, exactly. Rare is the family that's untouched by this. And we are back with the Sober Fall podcast. I'm Veronica Valley, and I'm joined uh, with Anne Dowsett Johnston again. Hi, Anne. Hi, Veronica. Hope you've enjoyed this just little stint of uh, co-hosting episodes that Anne and I have done. Um, and we hope we look forward very much to uh, seeing you guys in our five day masterclass that is coming up very, very soon. It starts Monday, the 22nd of January. Um, it's a masterclass for women who want to know how to be sober, how to get sober and how to more importantly, be emotionally sober. It uh, starts Monday, the 22nd of January, five days. There's a bonus Q&A actually on the following Monday. And it's going to be 1 p.m. Eastern time, which is 6 p.m. in the UK. Anne and I have worked on this for a long time. It took us a long time to try and get our diaries together. And it's been an ongoing conversation. It's a one-off thing. Um, It will be recorded. So if you can't make it live, sign up and come to, um, you can get the recording. Um, But we bring considerable experience and um, backgrounds uh, to this work. So I think it's something that you don't want to miss. Okay, so. What we're going to talk about today, Anne, this is an interesting conversation because it's not one I've thought about for a long time, but I think it was a really good idea to do it on going public with your sobriety. In So there's a kind of different levels of that. There's this sort of just, you know, beginning to tell the people around you going public. And then there's this sort of talking about it on a wider platform. So I'll tell you a little bit of my, my experience and then you can talk about yours because yours is really interesting. So when I got sober in 2000, there was no social media. The internet wasn't really a thing. And I came up through the 12-step programs who confused anonymity with secrecy. So I was, there was a general vibe of, we don't talk about it. No one talks about Fight Club. And I, you know, told my close friends and family that I was an alcoholic and I was in AA, told them a little bit of why, and that all went fine. Then I started working in the wider addiction field in England in harm minimization. And it was sort of, I encourage, like I didn't talk that, I, I just was a drug worker or an alcohol worker, but I didn't disclose my own personal history or background. Um, and I always thought that was a bit weird. And then anyway, I somehow got like, uh, I, I did an interview, like, cause I was so young, like I somehow got, a journalist reach out to me. And then I, I did various kind of, I did quite a lot of media talking about, you know, young female binge drinkers and all that kind of stuff. So not breaking my anonymity, but just talking generally about um, how I recovered from an alcohol problem. And I always thought that was a good thing because I knew I didn't look like people stereotype. And I got sober so young at 27. I knew I was breaking down a lot of like beliefs that people had about what someone with an alcohol problem looked like. I, I was on TV and it never bothered me. And I never really got, I don't think I got any pushback from that. Um, and then I, ever since then, I've just, then social media took off and I, I've always been fully out. Like I've never, and the, I want to tell you the only person who's ever had a problem with that is my mum, And it was a quandary for her. It still is, I think, because I'd be like on TV or in the new, like in a newspaper article. And my mum, like back when I was a kid, I would, you know, I did like dance and I like sometimes would be in the local newspaper and she's always really proud of that and cut it out. And my mum had this dilemma of being really proud that I'd be on like national television or the radio, but really ashamed of the subject. <laughs> right. And she, she was like, I, I don't think you should, you shouldn't talk about that. You, you don't. And, and, and it was, and it, of course, cause she was worried that it would reflect badly on her. And I never specifically spoke about her, but I, so I didn't, that's kind of the experience I had. I, I, by the time, I don't know, social media and all that kind of stuff was a thing. I, I, I'm just so out with it. Like I, I never batted an eyelid, but I'm really interested to hear about what your experience was like. It was a huge dilemma because 
I had been an, a journalist in, and a columnist in our national news magazine, which is like Time or Newsweek in Canada. And so I had face recognition. Then I went on to be vice principal of McGill University, which is arguably our biggest university in Canada. And that was when I went to rehab. Hmm. And so the question was, when I proposed writing a 14-part series on women and alcohol in Canada's biggest newspaper, would I out myself as a person with a drinking problem? And my editor said, are you independently wealthy? And I said, no. And she said, then you can't because you will never get a job again. And she refused um, to let me out myself. And so I wrote a huge, well-received series, 14-part series on women and alcohol that became the foundation for my book, Drink, <laughs> and never once said, I have a drinking problem, and never once said, my mother had a serious drinking problem. Six months after that, I thought, I can't live with this. And so I went to a book agent, sold my book for at auction for a huge amount of money and wrote Drink, in which I outed myself, at which point my sister, also very prominent in her field of veterinary medicine, said, you can't do this. You cannot do this. You will never get a job again. Same, the same story. I did. And since the book was called Drink, um, my sister would say, please don't tell the hard stories on yourself. And I'd say, you can't name a book Drink and not tell the hard stories on yourself. So my book came out in 2012 and it was, excuse me, 13, um, 2012, I wrote it. And it was not a time when there were a lot of Quitlet books. I was um, drinking a love story had appeared. Carolyn Knapp's beautiful book, but not much else. And so unlike today, when everyone is recovering out loud, it was a very brave and bold thing to do. And people were chatting, lots of chatter, a lot of chatter about the fact that um, I had been in that senior role, running a university, helping to run a university and drinking heavily. And there were times when that was uncomfortable. I did a lot of speaking. I did a, a TEDx talk that has 1.5 million views. So it's not a secret. <laughs> it's mm. far from a secret. But um, there were those who said, you mean when you were running that big place, that big part of the university, you were you were involved in heavy alcohol consumption? And I guess the final thing I would say is that when I grew up, my mother was uh, a so-called secret alcoholic, and I hated the secrecy, the so-called secrecy about what happened in our household, and I was determined that I would not be quiet. Mm. And also, finally, I was really convinced that I was one of a gazillion, because I am born squarely in the middle of the baby boom generation. If it has happened to me, it's likely happened to others. And in fact, that is indeed what the book said. And it ended up being true that, you know, the gen my generation ended up getting into trouble with alcohol, as many others did. But it's a big decision to, to come out and to come out about the depth of your problems. Hmm. Um, well, so they were wrong and you did work again. <laughs> I did work again. In fact, I not only got jobs, I got good jobs and it was powerful um, to tell the truth. Powerful to tell the truth. However many years later, 10 years later, not a week goes by when I don't receive mail from people saying, I read your book. It's my wife. It's myself. It's my aunt. It's my mother. And so. It's common, as we know. It's common, and it's it takes the sting out of it. That's the that's the main thing I want to say is that I have no regrets. Owning it is not uncomfortable, and is a way to move forward. Yeah, I mean, things have changed so much, and I, I really put it down to the rise of Instagram. And so, what maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, maybe a bit longer when Instagram really took off and then more and more people started sh sharing their stories. And that combined with 
a general change in atmosphere where we are much more aware of mental health and people's, you know, journeys and not, and, and not stigmatizing people as well. I mean, because the irony is, it's like, oh my God, the shock horror, you were in charge of a big university and you were drinking too much. Well, I hate to break it to you, but <laughs> there is a lot of people in charge of a lot of things that are drinking too much. I mean, politics, <laughs> our yes. politicians, I, I, every, I have clients from every single profession and it's, it's not, it, it's not exceptional. It's the norm. But everybody's drinking too much, especially in the UK. Everybody's yes. drinking too much. So, oh, th- I mean, there's so much there to kind of unpack, isn't there, about um, th- like perception, you know, that, that it just boils down to like, we think an alcoholic is a smelly old person on a bench who's homeless, right. not someone who looks like you and me. And and you're not, you're saying, I, you know, I'm in recovery. I'm not, I'm sober now. Like I'm not, drinking I don't know there's just there's so many kind of misconceptions and belief systems that well it needed all these people to come out and to shatter it and now I think it's really normal I almost feel that people kind of fall over themselves to to announce on social media that they've stopped drinking and I think it's done wonders for destigmatizing. I can't imagine getting waking up like when I first started stopping drinking with a hangover and going through social media and going, oh, she looks nice. She's my age and she hasn't drunk for six months. Like, what? Like, because I never even thought not drinking was a thing. Like, I didn't know that that, like, that was a life option. <laughs> right. You know, it's interesting that in my book, um, I asked all the women who told their stories if they would rather be known as a depressive or a person with mental health issues or a person with alcohol issues. And every single one of them said mental health. They would prefer to know they were still embarrassed. But I I think if you ask them that today, what you're saying is that both have been destigmatized. And it's really interesting in Canada where the low risk drinking guidelines came out in um, a year ago and made headlines all around the world because yeah, they're yeah, a yeah, front yeah. runner and yeah. and where people are encouraged not to drink more than two drinks a week, which is extreme and the public found it extreme. But it's interesting anecdotally how many people are changing their drinking behavior um, based on that just to say, I'd rather live a healthy lifestyle. I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, be vibrant and, and healthy and People are making interesting choices and non-alcoholic beverages are selling like hotcakes. And um, it's a very um, interesting time in, as you say, the whole Mm. recovering out loud and Mm. the comfort with that. Mm. And just, just seeing images of, because the other thing is none of us look like the stereotype. And, And that's the big thing. That's the first thing is like, I mean, I still, you know, of an occasion, if I'm in an, like an, an environment, maybe a cocktail party and people politely chit chat and ask what I do. And then inevitably they ask me, how did I get into that? And then I'll say, oh, I'm a recovered alcoholic and cocaine addict. <laughs> and I like that they're like, because oh, I look, you know, I just don't look like, and, and everybody, here's the thing, everybody knows somebody who has an alcohol problem, everybody. And, and most of those people are, you know, they, they've checked the boxes, they've got a nice house and a car and they've got a job and they look good and diddler. Um, so it's been really hugely beneficial, but it is, it is a step for people, isn't it? I, I know some, I mean, do your clients struggle with this about the struggle that my clients have is like, what do I say? I'd like, lots of people don't want to use the word alcoholic. That's fine. I was just use whatever you want. Just say you don't drink. Like you don't have to label yourself. But there's this kind of period of time where they stop and they, it's this what they say to people. Yes. And how to present it and all that kind of stuff. That's, do you find the same? Yes. I think that early period where you feel like a peeled grape and that all your veins are show, showing, um, I think that, you know, the obvious is never be without a drink in your hand when you go to a party. Mm. I always say... You know, and this comes from my journalism background, is interview the person 
talking to you. Change the subject quickly and say, how are you? How's your job? How are your kids? People love talking about themselves. So that extreme self-consciousness that we have when we first start drinking and we think we're the focus of attention. Don't make yourself the focus of attention. Allow somebody else to hold the microphone and be center stage and you'll find it's actually very easy. But there is that great sensitivity and self-consciousness of, oh my goodness, you know, do I say I'm on antibiotics or or that um, I have another reason for not drinking, I'm pregnant. And, and I just say, don't overcomplicate it. Have some ginger ale in your hand, some Pellegrino and go forward and you'll be fine. Yeah, there is that self-obsession is what we think other people are going to think and nobody's thinking about you. The only people who will ever have a problem with you not drinking, especially if they've known you as a drinker, are the people who have a problem with alcohol themselves. Those are the only people who will have a problem. I think there is a period of adjustment. See, I mean, I've been sober 23 years. So most, I mean, I have a handful of friends who I, I know from before, but most of the people have met me in sobriety and don't know me any other way. So. It, that there was no real adjustment there is that adjustment of we have a kind of family and set of friends who knew us before as a drinker and now we're sort of reintroducing ourselves as a non-drinker that 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 I I always uh, describe that as um it, there's a renegotiation of our friendships that happen um and it's a great way to find out who your friends are because the people who are, or, who are also drinking too much are the people going to have a problem with you declaring yourself as a sober person good friends will just support you Mm -hmm. there's just a you know I I remember I I was living in Key West in Florida and people would come and visit you all the time when you live there and I'd be like oh god you know they're gonna have an awful time because we're not gonna go out to the clubs and drink till 4am and 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 then I realized nobody wanted to that was me Uh, (laughs) ah dragging everyone around and doing ridiculous things yeah good point and that I you, often you the you're the person who's the instigator of the shots and the next round and people sort of go along with it but they were growing out of it and I was getting into a problem. That was me. We'll have another bottle and I'll pay for it. And um, it was a very expensive habit. Yeah. yeah. Very expensive habit. Yeah. So after all these warnings, did you get any pushback when you finally just? like when drink came out after all these people saying it's going to be like, how did you, (laughs) so the sister, like how did everyone, like how did all that land? My neighbor, my beautiful neighbor, who's a a lovely woman said, Anne, did you think you were talking over the fence? Why would you have told all those stories on yourself? I think for my sister, it was awkward. Nobody asked Mm. her to write um, a book on the fact that her mother and her sister had been alcoholics. So she has a high profile job. That was a little difficult. Other than that, everything was fine. Mm. Everything was fine. And my sister is my closest friend. So all is well. I learned the hard way the first New Year's not to be the designated driver. I made that mistake. What, what happened? I offered to be the driver and then learned I had to stay till the end of the party, which you don't want to when you're not drinking. Oh God. I, I used to be the designated driver. Like, so when I was maybe 29, 30, I had some friends and they drank, but not much. And I'd be like, I'll drive. But just so you know, when I want to go home, I'm going home. Like I would always make, that's, I would make it very clear, which was usually around midnight because if people were drinking, that's when it starts getting messy and I'm just not interested and I've had enough fun and I just want to go home what have you. But yeah, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that ever. Drunk people are boring. <laughs> so boring. When they start repeating their stories, you know it's time to leave. I think I think the other thing that people get anxious about is when they have certain professions. There is is professional consequences. And you know, first of all, I just want to say to people, it's no one's business. It's nobody's business. I just, you know, I don't drink. You do not owe anybody an explanation or story. I think th- eventually when you feel ready to come out as a sober person, I just think go for it. Like I I don't think I've really come across anyone that's had a bad reaction. Have you? Never. No, I haven't either. I don't, I think people, because I think the thing is everybody struggles with something. Everyone, whether it's alcohol, everybody has struggles and all you're doing is saying, I've had a struggle and I've got some help with my struggle. People actually feel very liberated by that. And and they relate very strongly to it because I, I don't know when when I 
I used to think everybody else was fine and I was the only person with a problem. And and that's a ridiculous perception, but I believed it. I believed everyone was fine. I thought you were fine. You were just fine. You had your, you knew what life was about. I thought that of everybody. And it's, mm. it was quite, that's quite a naive and childish view of the world. Everybody has, everyone has struggles. So when we talk openly about our struggles, it liberates other people to talk about theirs is what I have found. Or, I mean, you probably, do you have this, this happens, you know, can I talk to you about my brother or my yes, partner? Yes, yes, yes. Or... You know, there was a time that um, in Canada, I was really well known for a certain project in journalism and everybody wanted to talk to me about education. So I did university rankings. Everyone wanted to talk about education. I wrote about alcohol and everybody was quiet. And I thought, isn't that funny? Everybody's quiet. But what they did do is wander up to my desk at the newspaper and say, it's my, it's my mother. It's my mm. sister. It's mm. me. Mm. It's my best friend. And mm. exactly as you say, everybody knows somebody. Mm. And um, it is so common. And rare mm. is the family that's untouched. It, it, well, that's it exactly. Rare is mm-hmm. the family that's untouched by this. I had a client um, who uh, she's sober a few months now, and she said she was really, really struggling. And she just bumped into a fellow mum on the school run, and they had a quick chat. And the mum said, "I've stopped drinking now for six months, and I just feel really good, and I'm going to just continue with it." And she just had this like light bulb moment of oh my god if she could do it maybe I could do it as well nice and it was that one conversation that triggered her and she's about eight months sober now Uh, which is just and again we didn't we we just weren't doing that 20 years ago there's a lot you know there's a lot we I don't know if we want to go into it here about the anonymity being mistaken for secrecy that hasn't been helpful and there's a difference between anonymity and secrecy and and this does need to be talked about and when we make it secret it it builds the shame of it and I don't know I hope that we're getting to a place now I think where people can talk about it I remember when um I don't know if you remember this who is that American news presenter Elizabeth who wrote she wrote a book yes 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 Elizabeth I know exactly who you mean can't remember her name Anyway, so she was kind of outed in the press. She was yes, at the first She Recovers event and she went to rehab and she kind of released a statement saying, I, you know, it's come out to my attention that I, I, I've struggled with an alcohol problem. I'm going to go and get necessary treatment for that. And her mm-hmm. career, she, her career she, was a, she hosted one of the presidential debates just uh, last week, I think. Um, and then at the same time, there was another presenter on a morning show. They, the morning, sh- like today or whatever it was, um, they were all doing like mammograms and uh, what have you, colonoscopies, just to spread awareness. And one of the presenters came back and she, they found the breast cancer. And it was like, oh, my God, thank God I went to the mammogram. I'm going to take some time off. I'm going to deal with this. And blah, blah. And I thought, gosh, I can't wait for alcohol problems to be treated in the same way. Yes. Is, is that woman just talked about. I remember seeing the two parallels of that, that we're not, we weren't quite there yet. And this would have been maybe seven, eight years ago of like the alcohol problem is still kind of shameful. Whereas I've discovered I have breast cancer and I'm going to get necessary treatment. And everyone was like giving her a round of applause. We we need to get to that point where we can do that. I think. Say a little more about, um, for my benefit. And I think everybody's about uh, an anonymity versus secrecy. So, so for a long time, this, this domain has been dominated by Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, there's been no alternative for a long time. And then most of the people who ran, run treatment centers all over the world are usually people who've been, come through a 12 step program typically. And anonymity at the level of press, radio and film is that you, that you don't go on press, radio, film or the internet and go, hi, I'm John Smith and I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and it's this is why it works and blah 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 it never meant that you can't talk about your problem or that you have attended 12 step meetings it's that you don't talk in a way that represent that you're representing them right which is a very but it it was taken to mean secrecy i think i i definitely had long term sober people in aa tell me that 
like when I started working in the harm minimization field, which was with non AA people is like, we just like, it's just best not to, you know, keep that separate, you know, yes. want it to affect your career. Da, 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 da. And so I did, cause I didn't really know what to do and I just thought they knew better, but I was always thought it was weird. So I think that notion mm-hmm. of, um, then kind of, I think there's a lot of kind of AA speak that then trickle down into all areas of this domain. And yes. AA is just one method. It's the method that worked for us and and I love it. But there's lots of other methods that if you're consistent with can, can work and I've seen them work with people. So I think there's that, that kind of um, viewpoint has been tried to apply to other areas that it doesn't belong in. Yes. So I think I think a culture of secrecy came from the notion of anonymity that we can't and this and also it was relevant 50 years ago. You could definitely get fired from your job or have massive implications from being labeled an alcoholic or let you know and not ever saying that you saw I mean those were really good traditions to have, but I think it has been to our detriment that we haven't been able to talk about our stories and talk about recovery in in the public sphere. The fear was always that if people do that, say, hi, I'm John Smith and I'm representing AA and talking about this, and then that John Smith relapses, people think that AA doesn't work. So that I think that was always the fear. So I I think we've broken through this layer of secrecy now um, and anonymity is back where it needs to be um, because absolutely there's people who want to go and get help and they want to do that and be sure that nobody else knows about that until they're ready which is what we're talking about really going public with your sobriety a hundred percent and I do think there's a parallel with with it you know if you're gay it's like you don't need to come out with that until you're good and ready and nobody can do that for nobody should ever do that for you like you people need to go and get help for that until and if they feel ready to talk about that publicly to their friends their family or whatever platform that's completely up to them I agree does that make sense totally um I had a really difficult experience as I think you know when drink came out that there was um a goodly portion of the 12-step community I was involved with who Mm. who were really angry Mm. And and some weren't. So mm. it, it was a delicate issue um, and it remains so. So you have no regrets, Anne? I have no regrets. And, and I recently spoke at the opening of a rehab center um, in Canada that where there was a lot of nimbyism, people in the neighborhood saying, we don't want this rehab center. There's going to be, you know, needles on in the park and people on park benches looking like they've been drinking and I stood up to say no this is what this is what an alcoholic alcohol yeah. looks like and normalize um that fact and it was a very successful evening and there was a lot of a lot of comfort and a lot of open conversations so stigma stigma is real but it's also um shifting as you say yeah it is for sure well thank you so much for this conversation and these three episodes it's been great there's so many subjects I could talk to you about I'm really excited about our masterclass next week uh looking forward to seeing so many uh women there make sure you've gone to soberpool.com to sign up uh there's also other a whole bunch of various uh our social media and our emails make sure you're on our emailing list and just say where people can find you just quickly yes I am and no e Dowsett, D-O-W-S-E-T-T, johnston.com. And we will put that all on um, the show notes as well. And you have a sub stack and you're on Instagram as well. You can find Anne there too. I am. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And we will be back next week. Take care. <laughs>